let's be honest with each other. You don't really give a shit about I've me, I've changed you? my outlook on life because of you. What the fuck are you talking about? Of course we all love you. You could crush me Prove it. in a second. Prove it. How? What do you want us to do? We traveled into the fucking nine hells to get Pike a suit of armor. We went and battled a city of vampires so Percy could feel good about his name. We fought Goliaths for Grog. We've traveled across planes of existence so you could fix your fucking daddy issues. But you've never done anything for me, ever. You've never risked anything. You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. What's my mother's name? What's her name? Easy question. Died in front of me. Killed by a goblin. Biggest part of my life. What's her name? This clip is taken from Campaign 1, Episode 85 of Critical Role. It's a pivotal scene in Scanlan's arc and is often put among the top moments of Campaign 1, if not all, of Critical Role. I think it resonates on an emotional level with most people because, unlike the other members of Vox Machina, there's an emotional depth to Scanlan Shorthout that most weren't considering. Sam Regal, though a funny guy, is playing a well-developed and fully realized character. A character with motivations, hopes and dreams, fears and insecurities, all of which are put on full display in this one moment of frustration. When D&D players think of, quote, good roleplay, I'm sure they think of moments like this, when the backstory and the campaign line up to provide these really moving moments. But if you've never had a moment like this in your game, let me remind you that these guys are professional D&D players. Simply put, they have the resources, time, and assets to line up their campaign in a way that most of us could only dream of. But more than professional D&D players, they are professional actors. Sam Regal has over 350 credits on IMDb and, you know, an, an Emmy for voice direction. So for us amateurs, is it possible to draw these types of performances out of our own games? With no training and no acting experience, what are some ways that we can enrich our role-playing to create these types of moments? In this video, I'd like to talk about a concept, a state of mind for performing, that I believe can help us all get a little bit closer to Sam Regal levels of performance. I mentioned in another video my experience with improv and how several of its tenants have helped me in my role-playing journey, and I'll assume that that video's success is due to the value of its message rather than simply putting Brennan in the thumbnail, but anyway, that logic in the video is the same as in this one. D&D is like improv comedy in that the players and the DM are responsible for generating information about and responding to the world around them. When it comes to connecting with an audience, improvisers are normally taught the concept of emotional honesty. When improvising, so much is going on that it's easy to forget that you're playing a character. And while they may not be fully realized or explored just yet, all people, all characters, have motivations, hopes, and dreams, fears, and insecurities. Take a minute to think what motivates the way that you respond to things. Do you always react based on what motivates you? Do you sometimes react in ways that you wish you hadn't? Do you think things that are irrational or say things you shouldn't have said? Emotional honesty seeks to explore the more human side of performance. Put simply, it asks the performer to step inside of their own head and their own emotions, rather than just glancing over the situation to get to the next story beat. To really honestly consider the circumstance the character is in, and what an honest emotional response would be to that circumstance. I'm going to play a clip from Dimension 20's Fantasy High campaign, episode 14. Spoilers for that campaign. You see, Riz Gutgak, played by Brian Murphy, is introduced at the top of the campaign as a wannabe private eye, investigating the disappearance of his babysitter, Penny. This is his main motivation throughout the campaign. He's kept up at night with nightmares about her disappearance, and in episode 13, he finally finds her. Well, a digital version of her trapped inside an arcade machine. Riz, after being sucked into the arcade game, claws his way through glass to try and keep from losing her. This is the closest he has been to finding her. And then Riz is rescued from the arcade game and is brought face to face with Biz Glitterdew, a minion of the game's big bad evil guy. Glitterdew knows what happened to Penny. Now, with that out of the way, I want you to watch Brian Murphy throughout this scene. I understand that the other members of D20 are playing this scene for a laugh and are making jokes at Glitterdew's expense, but just, just watch Murphy. No! 
Oh. Wow, you're stupid. I no! Put, I put my hands on him. Grab her, grab her, grab her. I put my gun to his head. Those girls are going to the AV club. What happens to them once they get there? Five, four, three, two. Ay, 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 shoot, shoot a finger off. Bam. <laughs> The what happens? This is no way. What happens? Okay. What happens? What happens? Hey, what happens? Five, five, four, three, three two, two, one. Bam! Ah! Not a I, Where just, did the I get go? excited by the counting and I help count. Okay. A, B, C, D. Stop. Everyone stop. Okay, we're gonna go slower this time. I'm gonna give you 20 full seconds to tell me, and this time I'm gonna blow your head off. You okay. did you just kill my friend? What did okay. you do? I burning hands his crotch. <laughs> I think this scene is powerful. Riz Gutgak is willing to set aside his morals to figure out what is going on to save his friend. It's a powerful indicator of the strength of his convictions, and this performance by Brian Murphy is so zoned in, this is an honest, emotional response. It causes me to ask myself, what would I do if I had searched so long to find a friend only to have them taken from me again? What would I be willing to do? It endears Riz to the audience, and it causes us to sympathize with him, even if what he is doing is, you know, torture. So what can we learn from these performances? What steps can we take to get an emotionally honest performance out of our own characters? What techniques lead to these moments? In my mind, there are three simple steps that, if followed, can lead us to the emotional honesty that we're looking for. One, let it hit you. I think it's bad that she thinks that I'm an oath breaker, that I am weak, that I failed in my promise to her. Scanlan. That everything she thought of me when she found me is confirmed now, that I can't be trusted and I can't protect her. Scanlan. She thought nothing of you when you met her, all right? The fact that she showed up here and saw that you gave your life for a greater cause, that's so much more important than any, any promise you made. I hope that's true. I think it is. I've extolled the virtues of active listening in other videos, but this step requires more than just listening. In real life, we don't need to think about our feelings, we just feel. But oftentimes in the course of tabletop role-playing games, we're playing a character so far removed from ourselves that when it comes time to respond to an emotional incident, it's worth taking a moment to think about how to respond. And I found the best way to do that is to try and empathize with the character. Really let the emotional weight of a discussion or a circumstance fall upon you as it would your character. Like Sam did in the last clip, it's okay to not know how to respond right away. It's okay to take the time to internalize the circumstance so that you can more quote unquote accurately respond. In truth, this is how we respond in normal situations anyway. We must experience the emotional or physical stimuli before we can begin to respond. 2. Center yourself in the character Seeing the emotional performance of Murph that I showed earlier, it's easy to tell that Brian Murphy has zoned into what Riz was feeling. It's impressive, not just in its own right, but because of what took place literally five minutes earlier. A nat 20. A nat 20. Right, we'll we'll one at a time. One at a time? One of these will be a nat 20. Die number one? You just rolled a nat 20. Die number one. 10. Ten. Nat That's 10. half of a nat 20. <laughs> half All the way up to a nat, nat 20. Yeah! Look, I don't have to tell you about the highs and lows of D&D. I don't have to explain to you that within most games, there's a fair amount of framework, storytelling, metagaming, and all-around shenanigans outside the canons of the campaign. That said, in these emotional moments, it's important to root yourself in your character before responding. It's like in a video game where you switch from third to first person perspective. Allow yourself to assume the role of your character. If you're able to do this, the table will be more able to feel the weight of what is happening and will therefore be able to respond in kind. And then finally, react. React honestly. 
For this third step, you've already seen the examples previously. Those performances are moving to me because in the end, they convey an emotional weight that makes those characters feel real. Deep down, I can see the complex emotions of the person informing those character decisions, driving those performances. Once you tee up the introspection and finally get into character, allowing your own personal emotions, your own personal experiences to inform your character's reactions allows you to deliver these profound performances. I'd like to end with a non-professional example, one from my home game that streamed live on Twitch, Antumbra Echoes of the Eclipse. I believe it's a wonderful example of these three steps being utilized. In it, Eldritch Sugar is playing Adelaide, a wizard on the run with a magical book, Lex. It's been revealed that Adelaide is somewhat responsible for the soul of Lex, played by DM Captain Cheeky, being bound into that magic book. Throughout the course of the campaign, Adelaide has struggled with trusting the rest of the party, working tirelessly to try and restore things, to restore Lex to the way that they were. So, back up against the wall, she makes the choice to leave the party to try and parlay with the big bad evil guy of the campaign. And as you watch this scene, see if you can tell the moments where Eldritch lets the weight of her predicament hit her, where she centers herself, and where Adelaide responds with emotional honesty. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. We're changing sides. What we're doing is getting out of here. I mean, if we could go, I, I could save you, Lex. I, if we go back to when none of this ever happened, I could find you. I can make sure that this never happened to you. We could run away. We could go anywhere in the world. I mean, don't you He's want like that? visibly like ghost sweating right now. <laughs> I would rather fix myself now than risk being someone I don't like back then. Because I have no idea what I was like before being a book. Well, you don't have to go with me if you don't want. <laughs>